Lisa Turkers. Welcome to the Proverbs 31 Ministries podcast, doing a series called Therapy and Theology. And I want to welcome my partners in crime, my co-hosts, my fellow brilliant humans, Joel Mutamale. And Joel is, of course, the resident theologian at Proverbs 31 Ministries, and Jim Cress, who is not only an amazing therapist, he's my counselor, my personal counselor, my family counselor, so appreciate what you do, but you also have a degree from Dallas Theological Seminary. Mm -hmm. So welcome to both of you. So excited for this episode. Today, yeah. we are talking about emotional maturity, emotional immaturity. What are the signs of both of those? So I wanted to start out today by reading something. This started off as a text message to a friend. She may or may not also be my hairdresser. Um, <laughs> Only your hairdresser knows for sure. So <laughs> That's right. Um, but she's an amazing gal that had a question about something she was struggling with. And I answered through a text, but the text message prompted me to go over to the notes section in my phone and just keep writing. So it started off as a text, wound up wow. becoming an eventual, probably future chapter in a future book. But I wanna read a little bit of it to you today. Um, I said, a friend recently said to me, your healing will bring out the emotional immaturity of those around you not willing to pursue health for themselves. What a true statement. And by acknowledging this, it helps to make sense of the tension that exists in relationships where I'm wrestling over decisions this other person is making that feel so unexpected and sometimes even shocking. Either way, I never thought that they would do what they're now doing or make the decisions that they're now making. If this is you, do not be surprised by the tension. And when this other person tries to label you as difficult or uncooperative, See it as a compliment. If they are making choices that are hurtful to you and refusing to acknowledge your concerns, then the relationship can't function normally. There is tension because you are now doing the difficult work to no longer cooperate with dysfunction. And you are probably saying to yourself quite often, is it me? Am I crazy? No, you are not. Chances are it's just because you are no longer cooperating with their dysfunction. And when this starts to happen, emotional immaturity is in play. Mm -hmm. So I want to make sure that we fully acknowledge all of us are a combination of mature and immature moments. So this isn't to point a finger at someone else. It's really to help create some self-awareness and to help better understand when we're in relationships that we cannot possibly discern in the moment what's really going on here. We may want to consider this reality the signs of emotional maturity, and make sure that we are leaning in the direction of being emotionally mature. So, Jim, I've got a list of some things that I've noted in my more emotionally mature moments. We've already stated I have some emotionally immature moments too. But um, I've made a list of some things. I know you have a list, so let me start with my list, Please. and I'd love to hear yours as well. Okay, committed to healthy habits. In other words, we all at times go through very hard days, very hard seasons, or even coping with past trauma or even present trauma. And we can have a tendency to have coping mechanisms that are not healthy. Um, and so emotional maturity though recognizes I need to have healthy habits in place so that when I have a moment of stress, trauma, a trigger, that I, instead of going to unhealthy habits, that I've already preloaded my life with enough yeah. healthy habits that I've learned to turn to healthier ways to respond to the trauma or the trigger or the really hard day. So committed to healthy habits. Two, self-awareness, which means I'm aware of how people 
are perceiving me and I'm aware of what I'm adding, good or bad, That's into good. a situation. And that goes hand in hand with others' awareness. I can be aware of facial expressions or tone of voice that I can discern some things about other people and make sure that whatever I'm contributing to the conversation that I'm not adding to the hardship of this other person, right? Okay, so self-awareness and others' awareness. Um, another sign of emotional maturity. I'm able to own my stuff without saying, but you. Big one. That's a big one. <clears throat> and Jim, I know you have a, you have something you've taught me that when you start to say, but, that's when the real truth comes out, right? And so you can put, and, which is a difference, to say this is true, and this is true. The human brain's wired when it hears but, is to think, okay, so disqualify what you just said. Like, you're a really nice person, but. Now you're gonna tell the truth. Now I'm gonna tell the <laughs> truth, right? And so I'm learning to be able to own my stuff without saying, but you. And Jim, you've also taught me that blame, the but you, blame is an attempt to discharge pain mm -hmm. onto another person, That's right? right, yeah. Um, okay, and another sign of emotional maturity is empathy and being able to understand or even think about before I act, right. what is the impact that this is gonna have on the other people that I do life with and almost pre-deciding I need to be empathetic to these people. I need to care about them. So it's not just empathy in the moment, like you're having a hard day and I'm gonna sit with you yeah, and, right. and be empathetic. Like I see you, I hear you, I, I wanna know more, help me understand, you know, just being that gentle, kind voice. But it's also saying I need to have empathy for people before I act, before I say something. And so really thinking through what's the impact of this on another person. So all of these things I've noted as signs of of emotional maturity that I want more of in my life. Yeah, thank you. And uh, this list might cross over a little bit too. So I'm going to also, I just thought as I looked at this and studied this to kind of read some of the highlights so that I cover what I need to cover. I'm mindful of uh, 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober. Because a lot of the emotional maturity is what we call emotional sobriety. It's just a word in the Bible. Uh, AA didn't come up with that word sobriety. The Bible did. Be sober, be vigilant for your adversary, the devil. And I think your adversary trauma and unfinished business from your past, I'll put that in, but is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So we are to be sober and like be vigilant. We have to be even be a vig vigilant in our emotional sobriety or emotional maturity. I've shared on the podcast before that Scott Peck said that mental health that we all want is what? It's a commitment to reality, but it's at all costs. A lot of people I think tune out when you say a commitment to reality. They miss the last part, at all costs. To face reality in relationships, with yourself and your story, it often will cost you. And that's why a lot of people don't live healthy because they consider the cost and go, like the rich young ruler, mm, that costs too much and they don't do it. I want you to also, as we were talking here, we were talking before we went on camera here, to watch out for spiritual bypass. I see people do that where they will like bypass their emotions and what's going on in their internal world and just quote scripture on top of it. There's nothing wrong with the word of God but I'm bypassing what's really going on here. And remember that e emotions, as has been well said, are really emotions, energy in motion. So where's this energy going to go? So uh, one of the things with the brain that's important real quick is from this limbic system where emotions are stored, God set it up that way, to the prefrontal cortex where you're kind of in control and making decisions, that's like a six lane highway. Whew. But from the prefrontal cortex to kind of talk yourself down, you can do it. It's like a one lane country road. Just, that's why a lot of this, you're not just going to just talk yourself down when the emotions get what I call fully involved. And we're going to try to learn how hopefully to act rather than react or respond versus reacting. Reacting, if you think of it, is like redoing an action from the past, which we've said before, if it's hysterical, it's historical. Here's just a few more components of emotional sobriety. Uh, you've already said this, but this is a key one. To take responsibility for your life, people who are in a place we call a victim or a martyr stance, they blame, they're not going to take responsibility for their life or worse yet. They'll take responsibility then say, but. I'll own this, but you. And that's that quid pro quo that is unhealthy. Admit or mistake your mistakes and confess them. I like the Greek word homo legeo for confess. It means 
say the exact same thing. No, this isn't kind of sort of what I did to you. This is what I did, and don't put but. Our confessions should never be explained. Well, here's why I did it, is to say our sin should never be explained. Stay out of judgment. In Brene Brown's research, you're either in empathy or judgment when you're another person. You can say hard things, but I'm not in, in judgment. As we've talked about the trauma egg, take a look. If you want to get emotional sobriety, emotional maturity, somewhere, even if it's just with a friend, a pastor, certainly a therapist, take a look at the facts and the impact of your story. Because if you don't, what you don't work out, you'll act out. Pay attention as we've talked about fight, flight, or freeze. Because if you get in that freeze response, you'll just cement all this emotional maturity in and know. And you were saying this eloquently earlier about kind of stepping back here before you enter the arena, like, where am I? Be grounded in my own body. How am I getting to, I'm getting ready to go into this conversation. Well, watch, we prepare in times of strength, because he works out all the time. I think you do too. You yeah, know, really. But we prepare in times of strength for coming times of weakness. So why do we do this is to go out in that arena. Here comes that weak moment. I've prepared for this moment. Practicing, enforcing, which is much more difficult, healthy boundaries. We've talked on a whole podcast on this. Boundaries are to keep me safe and they're never to be explained. Pause before reacting or responding. There's a literal taking of the breath to, I mean, some people think that looks weird, but just say, I'm not going to say that. You've got to have a proper editor and filter saying, boy, I want to say this, and i got to honestly pause. The fruit of the Spirit, that's an emotional sobriety, to practice these things, especially self-control. And one that we've talked about before, and you've alluded to it, is really having before me. I don't want to be left to be a narcissist. I really don't. To seek first to understand before you're understood. And literally to feel that emotional sobriety and maturity say, Help me understand what's going on for you versus me coming in and telling you all that. Per people with emotional immaturity, it's all about them. They're unfettered, uncontrolled, and they're just like a garden hose or a fire hose just f f f all over the place. Mm -hmm. So that grounded emotional sobriety, seeking the other person and their understanding before you tell your piece. There that's, are more, but that's a few. That's so helpful. I, I want to have these like on a list <laughs> and I want to attach them to my bathroom mirror with some scripture yeah. and just look at it every single day. Yeah. Because, you know, while we have to have a license for um, so many things <laughs> that require schooling. So if you, if you want a medical license, you know, medical school, you'd go to school for a long time. If you want a driver's license, you got to go to driver's ed, right? Mm -hmm. But we can get a marriage license and we have friendship contracts. They're, they're not like a license, but we have an understanding of what it means to be a friend. But nobody's sending us to any kind of school <laughs> yeah. to say, hey, why don't we study emotional maturity and what you're really shooting for here? And, and I've even seen sometimes where people are very spiritually mature, but like you said, Jim, what they haven't worked out, they're going to act out. Yeah. And if there's a level of unhealed trauma, which we all have in our life, but there's a sense that you can quote Bible verses so much, mm -hmm. but you can have this general sense of weirdness when you're around them and you can't quite understand it because you see them as a spiritual pillar. And then the emotional side of things just feel real weird or real uh, covered up or there's just something there. You can't quite put your finger on it. And so, but because they're such a spiritual giant, you kind of walk away going, it must be me. Well, right? and that you know, spiritual bypass could be in play. And we've talked about this, but there is truly a, a developmental stuckness that often I would say to people, I think they're stuck seriously developmentally between four to 14. So they could feel like this wonderful spiritual adult, but relationally, if I didn't know better, it's the line I use, I have a sign in my office that says, how old would you be if you didn't know how old you are? Developmentally, they really are stuck in adolescent or even younger behavior. Mm. And so isn't good. it true that sometimes when we're having a chaotic reaction or we're putting emotional immaturity on display, that sometimes it is us reverting back to the age uh, that we were when there was some kind yeah. of trauma that happened that's gone unhealed. Totally. That's why proactively, if we go back to do this work in therapy, to go back and deal with that, we're trying to get people literally unstuck to help them 
1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter, verse 11, grow up to help them put away childish things. Graciously, like, what are you thinking? What are you, an idiot? Why are you doing that? If they're in previous podcast in shame or running shame scripts, they're not thinking and they are developmentally stuck. If we go back, we go there to find them. And often as I take people out of a family, I'll say, we got to take you out of the family and then appropriately we got to take the family out of you. As God took these people out of Egypt, then He had to take Egypt out of them. So part of that is just helping people literally grow up. So Joel, I know you've got small children. I do. And so sure. you know what happens sometimes just because they are young. You have very small kids. Mm -hmm. And so one, somebody hits somebody else and then all of a sudden they've gone from being seven years old to almost reverting back to two yeah. years old, oh, right? Yeah. Were you listening in on our conversation last night at the house? Yeah. yeah. Putting kids to bed? Yeah, you know. walkie-talkie? Yeah, walkie-talkie. I'm just <laughs> on speed dial with it's Brit. It's you know? done that. <laughs> but have you ever seen somebody like in the grocery store um, or even Target or Walmart or, or some store where they don't get something that they want. They're trying to return something and the store won't cooperate the with them. Or or yes, or <laughs> yeah. the drive through or whatever. And have you ever seen someone who's like 40 years old and they're, they're throwing a temper tantrum Literally. like they're mm -hmm. four? Yeah. yeah. So it's not that all of a sudden they have reverted back in age. But emotionally, their maturity has diminished down to immaturity in that moment. They're having a moment of extreme immaturity. But it's because, like you said, they're stuck. And that six lane highway from the limbic and trauma that's unhealed, it's like they snapped. Yeah, they did. Literally neurochemically, as far as the brain goes, they did. It's on them so fast. Yeah. I think what's really interesting, too, is that all of our conversation also has such a massive echo to a biblical storyline. If you think about, and you talked about Moses, and we're talking about the people of Israel trying to get uh, out of Egypt, but then get Egypt out of them, I think it's really interesting. Deuteronomy 6, the Shema. I mean, when, when God institutes to Israel how to do this, it's through a, what I call a theology of remembrance. Mm -hmm. It is remembering what the Lord your God has done. Remember the Red Sea. Remember the plagues. Remember how uh, the manna. Remember all of these things because otherwise if you are not remembering God's goodness in your life where He has redirected and reoriented you, you will remember uh, a false narrative that is kind of natural. That's why the Israelites often throughout the Old Testament are called stiff-necked, stubborn, um, because they go back to their enslaved condition. Hmm. It reminds me of the verse, and Jim, you use it often. I think it's Romans 13, 14, make yeah. no provision for the flesh. Mm -hmm. So I want to get into some more Bible teaching, but first, Jim, can I ask you, what is what like what is the deal here if we are if we are talking about emotional maturity emotional mm -hmm. immaturity do you get to a place and stay there yeah. or is it possible to become emotionally mature but still have lots of immature moments or the reverse to be emotionally immature but have just brief moments of emotional maturity like what what is the deal is there is there a level that you reach that you're kind of at that point stable or is it always going to be in flux? Well, one of the things that I say is for me, for all of us, is don't let your sin surprise you. Mm -hmm. It comes up, I can't believe I did that. There's always data. Proverbs 20, verse 5, the purposes in a person's heart, why you do what you do, are deep waters. So a person of understanding goes down deep alongside you to draw those purposes up. Progress, not perfection, we'll say. So the idea, if I'm dealing with things in my life and the emotional sobriety, which mimics human growth and development, I'm literally four or five, 15, 20 growing up. The issue is it will not be a ruling thing in my life. I will be largely emotionally and spiritually mature, reminding myself that Oswald Chambers, the great Christian writer said, he said it was impossible to be spiritually mature and emotionally immature that they're so tied together. So yeah, I think that that point I keep growing and developing, but there will then be moments where I will be triggered back and the issue is I say healed wounds don't leak infection, but that trigger can go and I grab it quickly back to taking every thought captive and make it to be to Christ. I catch myself and then I can, it won't be like I get triggered and I go back and literally the biblical metaphor, I'm literally back in Egypt, full tilt in slavery. I'll catch it and I'll go, mm, that's something I talk out loud to myself and say, Jim, 
You know better than that. What do you need? Or call a friend and say, man, something just happened to me with a client sometimes in counseling, and I felt all this stuff come up. Talk and process it, and I feel like it's like shorter and shorter, and the emotional sobriety is far more what I'm known for. Hmm. And I think when that happens, when that limbic system gets fired mm -hmm. and all of a sudden either fresh trauma is happening or triggers from past trauma yep. or just something terribly upsetting is happening in our life. You've taught me this and I think it is it has served me so well. Mm. You've taught me that it takes 20 minutes for the amygdala part of our brain, which is where our trauma and deep emotions are stored. It takes 20 minutes for that to calm down. Mm -hmm. So just give yourself a minute. Mm. And during those 20 minutes, get proactive about self-care. And that's not being selfish. That's truly that's right. caring for yourself so that you can have a better response and not an immediate reaction. So give yourself 20 minutes, drink four ounces of water. Um, I like to walk outside and look up and remind myself the sky is not falling because one of the tendencies of my personality is worst case scenario. And that's part of what makes me all of a sudden get into such a panicked place that emotional immaturity starts really like presenting itself, even though I've worked really hard to be an emotionally mature person. Well, and, and look what you just said. I, I use this all the time with people. It's, it's powerful. Let us use our bodies in good ways. Watch. We look down into our emotions and that trauma will be like Cro-Magnon man. It will pull you over down and then we look up. And how many times do the Jewish people in the Bible say, I look up, I look up. And even we, Fine. nothing wrong with praying. Our Father, and we go down and we pray. Fine, if that's what you, but the Jewish people so often lifted hands and they looked up. We look down into our emotions, whatever they may be, but we've got to then look up into the truth and the reality. And it literally neurochemically works. It changes our brain to look up and to walk is the other piece. Yeah, and sometimes I'll even take my shoes off, you know, and just like walk in the grass and. That's and grounding, you understand that part, right? You're grounding in God's, this is I our Father's will. I did not know world. that I was doing good work here, but No, yes. it really is, that's important. This is, when you get your shoes off and get, that's God's earth, and get in the, the, the whatever is emitted from the ground, the, the, the grass and all that, you're literally, most of us spend our days on concrete, we have a rug over this concrete, we're on, on slab or whatever. We're very seldom grounded into God's earth, just having our feet down in the ground. So that's very important what you said. That's great. And I like what you said too. Just, I've just, I know myself and I know worst case scenarios are not going to bring out a best case scenario in my response right now. That's a great right way now. to put it. Yeah. And so looking up to me is really important, but you were talking about the children of Israel getting out of Egypt, but then having to get Egypt out of them. Right. Think about what they did when they were in Egypt for their provision. They looked down at the ground. They needed the ground to give them their provision. But when God took them out to the desert, they had to look up for God's provision. And God's provision was manna, mm -hmm. little flakes that fell from the sky. And so that was part of getting that Egypt out of them. Yes. Like you're not going to be self-reliant anymore. I'm going to teach you to be God dependent and I think that's really important. So a little sidetrack though, it's really interesting with Exodus, it was necessary when God even tells Pharaoh through Moses uh, to let my people go into where? The wilderness. Why? To worship. Why in the world would the people of Israel need to go into the wilderness to be the the environment for their uh, act of worship? Uh, the wilderness was a necessary part of their journey to the promised land. It was in the wilderness they could do exactly what you just said. Mm, Love so that. So good. And I really liked your phraseology too, Jim, about saying emotional maturity is emotional sobriety. Mm. I don't know that I've ever put those words together, but it is being sober minded. It's not being swept up in traumas and triggers and it's not being swept up in coping mechanisms and addictions and all of that. And, and I think you have told me before that addictions really are a um, dysfunction of worship. A disorder and, of worship because yeah. It was back to where we were earlier in the podcast before of Jeremiah 2.13. Addiction is a broken cistern. I say, God, you're not enough, fountain of living water, and I go here. And it is, it is a worship. Even sometimes if you see it as worth-ship, I can go there and find my worth here. That's why it's, I think it's absolutely, it's much more than a disorder of worship. There's dynamics physically and all that goes on, but it really is that for sure. So all of us can be pursuing emotional and spiritual maturity yeah. 
but still have moments of immaturity and what do we do in those moments? And so I really think it's important, give yourself 20 minutes, drink some, uh, at least four ounces of water, go outside, look up, remind yourself that the sky is not falling, you know, put your feet into the ground and just, you know, stabilize yourself for a while. But Joel, there's also some really good passages that we've mm -hmm. talked about. Yeah. So I wanna turn over to Colossians chapter three. Is that a good place to start? Yep, absolutely. Okay. So let's turn over to Colossians chapter three. And Joel shared with me earlier some research that he's done that I think is gonna be mind blowing. So do not miss this part. Mm -hmm. um, if we look at Colossians chapter three and Always go to the table of contents if you can't find Colossians or <laughs> look right here. It's just this many left hand turns from the back of your Bible. So oh, okay. that's always super helpful. But in Colossians chapter three, starting in verse one, since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Mm -hmm. And so many of these, I think, are signs of displaced worship or, or even immaturity. Yeah. You know, going back mm -hmm. to an age that, you know, you, you've, you should mature past this. But... Mm -hmm. It's sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to, so I love how it's past tense there. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. It's not becoming of you. Mm. You're reaching for something better. You're walking toward spiritual and emotional maturity. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here, there is no Jew, Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, hard word, how do I say that? Scythian. Joel? Thank you, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Mm -hmm. Therefore, therefore, so this is really important. It's like, okay, these are all these signs of spiritual and emotional immaturity. You used to do that, yep. but now you've been made new because of Christ in you. And because Christ is in you, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with. So now this is what we need to do every single day. Put on your new clothes that represent who you are, this new creation, spiritually and emotionally mature. Mm -hmm. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. So we were talking a little bit, Joel, and then the very next verse, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. And if you want to know what the payoff of emotional and spiritual maturity is, it's peace. Immaturity yes. is going to lead you to the opposite yes. of peace. Lying, slandering, um, practicing all kinds of idolatry or, you know, making other things more important than God and even sexual immorality, that is not going to lead you to the peace that will comfort your heart, but it will lead to a, a disruption, yeah. a destruction really of all the, that's good within you. Mm -hmm. So we want peace and the way we can let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts is by putting on these new clothes. Yeah. And if you think about it, think about when you go and buy clothes, okay? So if you're telling, put like clothe yourself with all of this, mm -hmm. when you go buy clothes, what's important? Let's just throw out a couple of things. What's important? You want to buy clothes that what? Fit. 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 Yeah. yeah. You want to buy clothes that fit. That you like. Yeah. And so it's okay 
for some of the different ways, the different personality types, the different wirings of people. It's okay if your compassion may look a little different than my compassion. Jim, you're uniquely wired mm -hmm. with incredible compassion and you're a therapist. So your garment of compassion is probably gonna look a little bit different than somebody else who has a different kind of career, right? right? Mm -hmm. So it's okay for your clothing to, you need to put it on as it fits you, yeah. but don't disqualify yourself. Like, oh, well, I, you know, I'm just a real practical person, or I'm just a real, you know, I'm, a, I'm like a bull in the china shop. I have no compassion. You can't say that because you're instructed here. I love you that. need to get some compassion. You need to put it on. And if you're putting on this garment of compassion, you can make it fit you, but you don't want to walk out naked, absent <laughs> of compassion, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's another interesting thing about clothing? Well, are you going next? Because I have thoughts. Of, for one, for is. I think the idea, it also for me reverses this back to how many times are we going to keep going back to Genesis 3, that when I found out I was now naked and ashamed, mm. I didn't go to the right tailor, right? I just grabbed whatever was near fig leaves to cover my inadequacy. Of course, we know God in the narrative says for the first time mimicking Christ's sacrifice eventually that there will be the shedding of the blood and cover yourself with animal skins. Yeah. So the idea in Ephesians 6, the, the spiritual warfare wardrobe that we can put on, that the clothing, by the way, we, you referenced real quick uh, the uh, passage in Romans 13, 14. I always do the second half of the verse. Well, the first half of the verse says what? Clothe yourselves in the Lord Jesus Christ first, then make no provision for the lust of the flesh. So good. Mm -hmm. Another thing about clothing is it's different seasons, you yeah. know, and, and so in the winter time, we don't put on shorts and t-shirts. In the winter time, we put on coats, right? Mm -hmm. And so there are different seasons where you that's need good. your clothing yeah. needs to properly reflect that season. Mm -hmm. And that's true with us, and it's also true of people that we're interacting with. You know, if I'm interacting with someone who's in a devastating season, then I need a warmer sense of compassion for them. And, or if they're going through just typical everyday stuff, maybe my compassion can be a little more, you know, just like shorts and a t-shirt, you yeah, know, yeah. a little more casual, whatever. Mm -hmm. Another thing about clothing is you wanna make sure that you've gauged where you're going to. So if you're going to an <laughs> official board meeting, right, you don't put on a, you know, gym shorts and, and tank top. I mean, you don't walk into a board meeting like that. So you want it to be appropriate for this setting that you're stepping into. So I find this notion of clothing, yeah. like we're very familiar with what it means to put on clothing. We know we have different styles for different times. We have different uh, seasons and all of this, but I think we can think of this in terms of compassion. But Joel, one of my favorite things that you've shared mm -hmm. is a deeper spiritual meaning of why are we putting on these clothes? And yeah. why is it referred to as clothe yourselves with all of these things? Yeah, so I think what's really um, intriguing about this is anytime you see repetition in scripture, there's a reason for it. You know, repetition always has reason. So when we look back to if he, uh, Colossians 2 uh, in verse 15, actually verse 15 sets up how to rightly understand the put to death and put on and, and all of this clothing language. This is what Colossians 2.15 says. He, which is Christ, disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Now that word disarmed in Greek is actually related to the putting on or putting off of clothes. And so in the ancient Greek world, um, if a king or if a ruler had conquered an enemy, it would have been common practice to then parade that enemy in a royal procession, in a party, uh, in front of the entire people so that everybody knows that the king has come and he is victorious. And there would be the ceremony where the enemy would disrobe their royal kind of clothes uh, and put on a different type of clothing to identify their defeat. So I think this is intriguing because what then Paul does in Colossians 3 is he's saying, by the way, 
All of that emotional immaturity stuff, the um, immorality, the lying, the debauchery, all of that kind of stuff, that has been uh, conquered, it has been defeated by Christ on the cross and all the spiritual powers, the authorities and the rulers and the principalities have been disarmed and their final defeat, it's coming when Jesus will return. But as that has been disarmed, we can then take off of our old self and put on these new clothes. What are the new clothes? It's what you just said, Jim. It is the clothes of Christ himself and the clothes are marked by these things that Lisa had said in verse 12, Colossians 3, 12, put on then compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. I wish we had another two hours because I would want to do a deep dive of each one of these <laughs> words and how they're used yeah. throughout all of scripture. But let me just say this, that um, in the Septuagint, the, uh, the Old Testament in Hebrew was translated into Greek. And in fact, that's probably the Bible that Jesus had. Jesus had the Old Testament in Greek. That's what Paul would have had. And these words here, in the Septuagint, in the Greek Old Testament, are the words that are used to describe God's actions. This is not arbitrary uh, maturity, arbitrary um, characteristics. These are the very characteristics of God himself. And so when we participate in this, we're participating in rightly imitating the likeness and image. We talked about this in the last episode of God himself. And then just a final thought of emotional maturity and uh, spiritual maturity. What we're ultimately talking about theologically is this idea of sanctification progressive sanctification. Our emotional immaturity will lead us to um, spiritual depravity. Like it will, those things don't work together. But when we participate in emotional maturity as evidenced by spiritual maturity, it's actually leading to this idea of progressive sanctification. It's leading us to something, to a certain place, to a direction, to a destination. And that destination for the Christian, for the person who has put their faith and hope in Jesus himself, is to emulate and to, and to resemble Christ himself. And so that's really what I think we're after. Wow. I love, love that. that. And yeah. I, I love the cloth clothing that is a sign of victory and clothing that is a sign of defeat. And Christ is saying here, you do not belong to defeat. That's right. So if you are putting on things of your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, idolatry, you're lying, you're deceiving other people, you are participating mm -hmm. in slander. When you're, when you're putting on those things, that is a sign of defeat. Yeah. And God is saying, no, you do not belong to defeat. Yeah. You belong to the victorious Christ. And when you belong to the victorious Christ, you put on, you clothe yourselves in signs of victory, yeah. compassion, mm -hmm. kindness, gentleness, patience, love. And I think that to me reminds me, bringing it all the way back to another important thing about clothing, you do it daily. Yes. And so back to my question, Jim, you know, can you be like, what am I? Am I emotionally mature? Am I emotionally immature? I am the maturity spiritually and emotionally that I choose to clothe myself yes. in each day. Yeah. And so many times when we talk about some of the principles of therapy, it seems like you've got to do your work and it's like this long-term payoff. Mm -hmm. But the payoff can be yours today. That's right. The peace of Christ can rule in your heart today when you choose daily to clothe yourself with these principles, mm -hmm. kindness, compassion. You can do it today. Today, be compassionate. Today, be kind. Mm -hmm. Today, be loving. Today, choose to be gentle. And when you do this, you are wearing the victorious signs that you belong to Christ and the peace of Christ will rule in your heart. Now, does that mean that you need to allow people to take advantage of you, that this is a sign of weakness? No, this is a sign of incredible strength because what you are choosing to do is you are saying, Jesus's power is full and alive in me. Mm -hmm. And I can still be compassionate. I mean, these other people can act like fools if they want to, <laughs> right? But I'm not freely handing over my power to them. I am saying, 
you do not have enough power over me to make me act foolish. I have clothed myself with compassion and kindness today, and it's not a determination of what you may deserve or not deserve. Mm -hmm. It's because I deserve to let the peace of Christ rule in me. Mm -hmm. So I am letting the peace and the power of Christ rule in me so that I can be an agent of compassion and kindness and love, even in this world that's full of brokenness and abuse and abandonment and rejection and all the other things. You deserve to have the <laughs> peace of Christ right. ruling in you today. Closing thoughts. I'll go. Remember that if you are working on, it is progress, not perfection. Again, if you're working on emotional maturity and emotional sobriety, the person who is walking with you in or around you who's in emotional uh, immaturity, it's going to be very hard to truly connect with that person. So do not be dis uh, surprised and don't go into judgment of them, but it will separate people in relationships. That's one. And two is just remember that you can have, I just think this clothing thing has really hit me in this podcast. You can have the clothing, a closet full of all the greatest clothing in Christ. And if you don't daily move from what I call the inspirational, heard a podcast, I'm inspired, I need to do this, like these podcasts. If you don't move from the inspirational to the intentional, the intentional is daily, I got to get in that closet and open up and intentionally dress myself. You'll be able to stay in emotional immaturity for a long time if you'd like. Yeah. All right, so let me close with this. This is the last little thing that I wrote that started off as a text message that moved into the notes section on my phone. <laughs> Water seeks its own level. Thank you, Jim. Another quote that you, give, you have given me. Water seeks its own level. Never have you seen a glass of water sitting on a flat surface where the water is low on one side and high on the other. Just like the gravitational forces help water achieve equilibrium, so will the pressures of life make it very evident that equilibrium in a relationship is only possible when both people are equally committed to healthy habits, self-awareness, and empathy for the feelings of the other. When one person dabbles in unhealthy habits, refuses to look at themselves through the lens of reality, and or stops considering the feelings of the other, there will be an ever-increasing tension until you sink or they rise. Wow. Only you can decide how to either manage that ever-increasing tension between emotional maturity and emotional immaturity, or when to say enough is enough and in compassion, move on. Thank you so much for joining us today.